tonight's competition that we're talking about is uh, the, the name of the host is Rainforest Connection, and it's about uh, detecting uh, species in rainforests through uh, audio de detection means. Pretty interesting competition. It just ended a couple of months ago. Well, we'll find out more about it here, but uh, it's one with a real interesting goal in mind, and uh, some of the techniques were interesting as well. I know that a lot of people here probably don't have that much background in audio processing, uh, this, uh, this, my presentation will be kind of in two parts. The first half will be about the competition itself and some basic stuff about how you, you process audio. Hopefully I can make it accessible to people of varying backgrounds. Uh, the second part is more about the specific solutions that the competitors used. And, uh, that will be a little more, uh, abbreviated and I'll use jargon and shorthand that may only make sense if you've had a little bit of familiarity with some aspects of machine learning, but hopefully that can be, uh, moderately accessible to people, uh, as well. So the, uh, I, oh, I will mention I was not a competitor, uh, in this competition. So I just read about it afterwards. And if you're not familiar with Kaggle, when the competition closes, often the people who did participate, publish their solutions and have a big discussion about it. And this is one of the reasons it makes such a great learning tool uh, for hands-on stuff in, in machine learning. And uh, there was a lot of solutions published uh, for this particular uh, competition, but we'll just talk about a few of them a little later, but let's uh, get back to what is this competition all about? So uh, the name of the organization is Rainforest Connection and their goals in doing this and, and what they're, uh, purpose of their organization is to monitor rainforest environments and help preserve them and uh, gather data that can help in that process. So they seem to be leaders in this field of having acoustic monitoring of forests, rainforests, uh, in real time for these remote ecosystems. And the, the goals of that is so they can get early detection of human environmental impacts. Uh, they want to measure how well restoration recovery activities are going, uh, you know, by keeping track of, you know, populations of the various animals and just generally make the conservation efforts more swift, effective and reactive to what's what's really going on there. Bruce, can I ask you a jumping ahead question? Yeah. Um, when you say uh, human environmental impacts, is that like effect on species diversity, for example, or is it like, I heard that there's this group that puts cell phones in the rainforest to detect chainsaws and stuff when people are deforesting, is that a word? Um, is it that, like, what do you mean by human environmental impact? It, it, presumably it could be both of those things. And uh, although f I, I don't know a lot about this organization, but I think it's more about, uh, yeah, tracking you know, diversity uh, and uh, numbers of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, various species and things like that. Yeah. Cool. But I suppose, yeah, if people start cutting it down and they're not supposed to, and you're listening, you're, you're definitely going to hear that. Sure. I think picking a ch chainsaw out of the recording would not, not be too hard. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So, uh, the goal of this specific competition then is to automatically detect bird and frog species in these audio recordings uh, in this kind of you know real time way. And it's a step toward a fully automated eco acoustic monitoring system. Right now, they seem to have a semi automated system where they'll run some algorithms over the acoustic data and it will suggest places where there might be the particular signature calls of and songs of these animals. But uh, then humans have to, human experts have to spend a lot of time uh, labeling that data. So they want to try to automate that. A little bit about the competition itself. So there's $15,000 in prizes. That's that's not nothing, but it's it's somewhat modest uh, in uh, by the standards of some of these Kaggle competitions, but it's fine. It attracted a lot of teams, over a thousand teams. Uh, started November last year, ended February, so I think that was a, like a three-month run. Uh, and so that's a couple of months ago it finished up. So a lot of data, 57 gigabytes of audio and metadata, most of that's audio. The audio consists of all these 
clips that are one minute long. Uh, they're encoded as FLAC, which is a lossless file format, recorded at 48 kilohertz. That's a pretty high sampling rate, so uh, it has the potential to be good quality data. And as you can see, you get about 4,700 training samples to develop the models on. And then you have to make predictions on about 2,000 test samples. There are 24 uh, species of interest, uh, but a few of them, a couple of them have very distinct calls. And so for the purposes of classifying the different calls, that uh, they got split out. So most people treated it as if it was a 26-way classification problem, and then they would combine the particular classes that belong to the same uh, species for those two. Uh, external data was allowed. It was kind of interesting. They didn't sort of officially allow it or disallow it, but it, uh, it was allowed to be used. Normally when that happens, they ask that you post where you got it and all that sort of stuff. That was never really formalized, but people just kind of shared that. Uh, anyway, we'll talk, we'll hear a little bit more later about what kind of external data was available. So here's the metadata information that you get. Uh, so the uh, first column here is the recording ID. So it's just some hopefully random number. <laughs> uh, I say hopefully because you don't want the, the name of the file to sort of give anything away. Looks pretty random. And then the, the species ID, uh, that's a number between 0 and 23. Though, though, these are the ones you, you have to predict, basically. Uh, the song type ID, this is mostly one. Occasionally there's a four. That's be, this is where there, there's sub uh, types of different calls from the same uh, species, not, not super important. This is also very interesting. They give you... Uh, T is time, F is frequency. They give you the start time, T minimum, and the end time, T maximum, of the call within this audio file. Similarly, for the frequency, here's the minimum frequency, here's the maximum frequency. So if you think of this as a kind of two-dimensional data, time and frequency, you're kind of getting a bounding box uh, of where the particular uh, sound occurred uh, and now, this is the training data, so this is all fully labeled. Uh, this, these are the, the labels that you get, basically. And what they ask you to predict, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but you don't have to predict the time and frequency. You just have to predict the ID, uh, the label. Uh, but they give it to you for, tra for training purposes. It makes it easier to nar narrow down where the action is happening. Uh, Bounty Box talked about that. So uh, that's called strong labeling, where you get these time locations for each sample. I, I think given that you're given the frequency dimension as well, I would call that extra strong labeling. And uh, some people call it hard labeling, strong labeling. I'll probably use both those terms uh, throughout this talk. But again, all, you only have to predict weak labels. Uh, you don't need the times. And you're doing it on the, the whole audio file. So in this one minute audio file, there can be several uh, species, and uh, so which ones are, are in there? And you don't, uh, well, it's not just sort of a yes or no, it's you would give a probability of them being in there. But the thing that you're ranked on or evaluated by is the ranking of those uh, predictions, which is the most likely, what's the next most likely, et cetera. We'll see more about that in a minute. So a question here, Bruce. Um, yep. A minute seems like a long time, especially for recording audio in a rainforest. Like I imagine yep. a lot of the files would have multiple calls from multiple different species in them. Yes, yes. Um, so do they, do they only ask you to predict one? Um, or are there, like, are there multiple true um, There's multiple true. Per sample? Okay. There's multiple true predictions per sample. So you have to, uh, it turns out that there's about, on average, about three per sample. And uh, you have to predict those three. And in fact, when we get to listen to some of this data, there's actually more than three. There's lots of uh, species that are not in their list of 24 that are there as confounding sounds. Um, so you have to ignore those. But uh, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot going on in these these audio recordings over the space of a minute, for sure. So that's so it, like th there's. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, go ahead. There's like three in the bounding box or in the whole audio? Sample? In the whole audio. So the bounding box is one okay. 
event, and that'd be one label, one species. Uh, but there can be several bounding boxes within the same thing. So if we, whoops, if we go back here, um, if you looked far enough through these, you would see that there's, uh, the, the recording ID is repeated several times. Okay. They're not sorted here, so you can't really see it, but yeah, it would okay. be repeated because one for each event. Would you also have cases where the same animal made a sound at 10 seconds and then also at 50 seconds in the same recording? Like, yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, How long? Mm -hmm. Sorry, you go first, Heather. Okay. <laughs> How um, like pure is the well, training do data? The like, again? do they um? Is there ever actually another species over top of the one that it's labeled? Like, I can imagine it would be difficult to isolate fully in these real world recordings. Uh. Yeah, it, there does seem to be overlap uh, for sure, and that's uh, that's a problem. Now, um, they the 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 different species tend to be reasonably well separated in frequency. So, as we'll see, a lot of the solutions are based on segmenting the data by frequency, and then just looking within those frequency bands for a particular uh, label. Uh, so that helps, but uh, no, absolutely. There's a lot of background sounds. There's a lot of overlapping sounds. There's multiple occurrences of the same species within audio. Basically every horrible thing that you can imagine <laughs> does happen. It's, it's a jungle out there. Uh, <laughs> but what it means is you potentially have a lot more than 4,000 training samples, right? If you split that up and that's true. Way. True. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I put some numbers down here. So uh, they give you both true positives and false positives. And I'm thinking that the, we get a lot, these, these are the true positives. These are where the, this actually occurred, but you get a very similar file, which are false positives. Uh, they're probably better described as true negatives. They're, you know, they're an animal sound. Uh, that you might reasonably ascribe to a certain species, but uh, it's not the one that's in the competition. So they give you like many more of those false uh, positives uh, to work with as well. Uh, now, I'm a little bit puzzled about the true positives being such a small number because that's actually smaller than the number of training uh, data things. Maybe th maybe there's some with no occurrence. Uh, there's probably lots actually with no occurrence at all. Maybe it's a zero. Uh, possibly. Because <laughs> if there are 4,000 recordings, then like, and on average three per recording, that should be like 12,000. You, right? you would really think so, wouldn't you? So I, I, I think I may have missed a zero there. Uh, maybe in both, both cases, because there's definitely more false positives than, than true positives. So don't worry about how many of them there are. Just ignore those numbers. Uh, I had one more question. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, um, the you've mentioned bird calls, but are, are they just birds, or are they are uh, they calls uh, of other animals as well? Uh, birds and frogs. There's some frogs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think it's mostly birds. Yeah. Go ahead, Will. Yeah. Um. I just want to uh, understand the uh, true positive and uh, false positive in this context a little bit. So we know that there are uh, sounds for uh, birds as well as uh, frogs. Um. So typically, when we talk about true positives, we are only, only referring to one class at a time, uh, right? But then uh, right now we have a multiple, possibly uh, multiple uh, classes. So uh, I would imagine there to be like more uh, uh, combinations of uh, true positives, etc., which uh, will make things a, a bit more uh, complicated. Uh, so yeah, these are definitely not true positives about one class. It's it means any of the twenty four classes is okay. counts as one of the true positives uh and the false positives like like in some of the external data like here we're talking about 24 species some of the external data came from potentially some of the same regions where these recordings are made and there's something like 10 times that many species actually that are there so um the occurrence of a a, a call from an animal that 
you know, could confuse you to think it's, it's one of the 24, but it's not. It's one of the other 200 and something uh, is very likely. So that's why there's so many false positives. There's, there's a lot of other species in these recordings that are not part of this competition. But true positive, positive means any of the 24 that are targets. All good. Anything else? Anybody? Yep. I have a question regarding species labeling. So if like, you know, if, if a, a particular audio sample is labeled frog, it's not always true that one frog is calling, right? So you could have multiple frogs calling. How does that influence the actual label itself? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. If they're calling it sort of exactly the same time and overlapping, that might be hard to separate those out. And you may not even recognize it as a frog. I'm not sure. But if they're calling it different times, then it's just different occurrences of that same species. And then the fact that it occurs once or twice or seven times in, in the file is not, doesn't really matter. You just say there's, there's a frog of this type. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Okay, so uh, if you're not familiar with audio processing, I'm just going to go over the real basics about spectrograms. The details are not very important for us. But the idea is that uh, you want to take audio, which is normally this, this time series. It's this waveform of amplitudes against time. Uh, that's kind of hard to work with as, as a time series. So what people will do is they'll, they'll break up the, the times into these little frames of these and size frames that go across time. And then in each frame, they calculate the Fourier transform to get the frequency content within that frame. And then they make this thing called a spectrogram. So along the x-axis, you have time in, in seconds. This is not one from the competition. It's just a generic one. Uh, uh, you've got time. Uh, the y-axis is frequency. And the colors, these are just pseudo colors. It's just a sort of heat map color scheme. But the in this case, like the brighter the color is, the more energy the, there is at that uh, particular uh, time frequency location. So you can see down here in the, in the lower frequencies, there's a fair amount of energy down here because it's brighter. As you get up to these higher frequencies, there's there's much less energy up there. But we'll see these throughout the su successive slides. So that's about almost all you need to know. For people who are familiar with spectrograms, uh, slightly surprisingly to me, they used MEL spectrograms rather than just uh, straight old spectrograms. Uh, MEL spectrograms have the frequency in a particular way along in a logarithmic scaling along the uh, y axis not not super important for most of what we're talking about but this this will come up later when we look at some of the solutions oh but i'll, I'll just say so you you kind of here taken the audio and turned it into an image so you might think that we could apply all the wonderful things we can do for classifying images to this sort of problem and that's kind of true, and that's what we'll see is uh, the approach that many people took. Here's um, examples. Uh, so the uh, competition organizers actually have published a paper on some of the work that they're doing. <clears throat> this comes uh, from that paper. And you can see here a very, this is kind of an idealized version of what's happening in the re these recordings. Uh, uh, these are actually frogs up here, and these are birds down here. Uh, I guess two separate recordings, I'm not sure. These are little snippets of the spectrogram. <clears throat> and th again, we're, we're sort of seeing the bounding boxes here that are encompassing the, the frequency and the time at which these things occur. And uh, you can see that there's overlap in frequency. They're not showing overlap in time, but that certainly happens as well. But they certainly overlap in frequency. And but there's also some separation in, in frequency uh, as as well. Not enough that you could just you know choose a frequency band and be done with it uh, by any means. But there's there's some clues there for sure. Uh, okay, so here's an actual example from the competition, and uh, I've uh, I've labeled this particular file has four labels in it. There's two. True positive TP here and this TP over here. And there's two false positives, this FP and this FP. And uh, here's for this false positive, here's the, the frequency band. I possibly haven't chosen my 
colors very well to really bring out the frequencies because this looks just like pretty noisy up here as opposed to something interesting. Um, but let me flip over to where we can uh, listen to this live. So uh, hopefully this is going to work. I'm going to put my cursor here, which I think you can kind of see that thin black line. So I'll start playing a little bit before this true positive, and I'll let it play for a few seconds after. And let's see if you can pick out the distinctive uh, animal call in this. Well, there was something distinctive there. Whether it's the right thing, I'm not sure. Let me uh, reveal it here. Uh, this is the, the frequency area. I'll just play it again. I think it's this DTTT thing here toward the end that's, that's maybe important, but let's, I'll play the, this, just this section. Maybe that's it, but you can also hear how many other sounds are going on there and how challenging this is. Uh, let me do this one. Uh, same story. This uh, this particular call lasts a little bit longer, but see if you can pick it out. Well, I don't know about you, but I found that pretty tough. And this you can see these bright spots along this frequency band here and also in the one just above it that just kind of goes throughout the whole thing uh I li i've listened to a few of these files and for the life of me i cannot <laughs> i would have a really tough time as a human labeling it particularly because the frequency region of interest is way up here and um unfortunately i don't have a really good way to just sort of mask out these frequencies so you don't hear the bottom ones but i i i did that a bit to just to hear but there's not a lot going on up here. This is where the identification for the pieces of interest is. Uh, now, I'll, I'll give you a preview of something that's to come up later, but you know, if that represents a call of a particular uh, animal, then, gee, what about all this other stuff? It looks pretty similar. Uh, yeah, as it turns out, they gave you some of the labels, but not all of the labels. But we'll come back to that in a minute. Just to show you the, the distribution of durations, not so much the distribution, well, the, the extent of the uh, durations. Uh, so the most uh, species really have a very constant uh, time duration for the for the calls so that we've got species id along the x-axis here and then uh, how long the duration is there's a few where there's a bit more of a spread uh, but not so much and then in frequency <clears throat> how much uh, bandwidth what what do they cover and again it can be pretty pretty narrow band or uh, actually this is bandwidth it's not really showing you mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Not the best, not the best diagram, but anyway, um, it, it shows you that there's, uh, in terms of bandwidth, there's a fair distribution. Uh, it's all over the place, essentially. Bruce, on the duration slide, some of those look like they were very short, like. They do, don't they? Oh, there's well. Not much, well, like, there's not much variation between a, the different files. Like there's yeah. almost. This is also sort of a function of labeling, though. So, I mean, humans uh -huh. could just say, you know, the bounding boxes are here and here and, and choose a constant length every time. Um, kind of looks like that's, that's what they point. did. Yeah. Like, I think I think I think there's something to that. Yeah. I mean, it's weird you get these sort of bimodal distributions too, like this one. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And in those samples that you showed us, I mean, that first one the call didn't start until almost the end <laughs> yeah, so I, I went like how much of these bounding boxes is actually they're definitely not a minimum bounding box so how useful are they even well Good to question. Me it sounded like in those um the, what i thought was the the call it, the, the bird kept on sort of oscillating between like low notes and high notes um so it might have actually been the full duration Okay, maybe maybe I'm just not good at birds. That might <laughs> totally be it. <laughs> yeah, I I was 
honestly, I was baffled by most of this data. I didn't spend a whole lot of time trying to sort it out, but I, I would have struggled, I think, <laughs> if I spent much time doing these kind of uh, analysis by, uh, by my own ear. Uh, here's another spectrogram. Somebody just, one of their kernels published this. So the green boxes here, they, which seem to actually kind of overlap, are four true positives, and there's three false positives uh, there. So you can see the different durations, uh, time duration and frequency extent as well. So, okay. Uh, we'll come back to the data in a minute, but uh, I do want to talk about how do you evaluate the predictions that people are going to make. So Wait, can I ask again, you one question before. That? Oh yeah, sure. Sorry about the Very bounding sure. boxes. Um, who made the bounding boxes? Like, was it scientists? Was it did they crowdsource it? How did that work? It, no, it was not crowdsourced. These were experts uh, who are you know, identification experts. And uh, I believe they use the procedure I described before. They, they kind of use this template matching as, as an automated way to flush out candidate regions where they're uh, the right species. And then humans would, would verify uh, that. Uh, presumably the humans would also, you know, change the size of the bounding box, but maybe they didn't do that so much. And that's why we saw such a tight clustering of them. All right, on to the evaluation metric, LWLRAP. I'm sure you're all very familiar with that. Label weighted, label ranking average precision. Well, this was new, new to me, um, so I was curious about it. Uh, but th the question we're asking is, okay, we're making predictions of uh, across the whole file. We're not really saying how many occurrences there are of matching uh, you know, labels, but how many different labels are there? And, you know, how many different, different species? Typically three, as we've said. Uh, so how do you, how do you assign a, a metric to that that's going to reflect whether you've done a good job of identifying those or not? Uh, not super interesting. So I thought before I looked at the answer, I sat down and thought about it and I came up with a scheme, which was not completely different from, from this, but I think there's is arguably a bit better. Anyway, this, uh, this number, which I'll, I'm going to explain in some gruesome detail here, but it's, it's strictly bigger than zero and it's less than or equal to one. Uh, the bigger it is, the better. So you want to be as close to one as possible. And just in words, what it measures is for each ground truth label, what fraction of higher ranked labels were true labels. So let me, let me work through a couple of examples. So at the bottom is the equation that actually defines this. But I, I, I want to understand this, so I actually set up a little spreadsheet. And uh, this is for a single prediction. Uh, so a single file, what you do is you'd, you'd make this prediction, you'd get a score in each file, and then, you know, you'd average over the, the samples. So in this uh, case, we've got eight different uh, species, and we've made our predictions, which are some probability-like thing. These, these sum up to one just by construction. Uh, but I put them here in order from the most uh, probable, according to our prediction, down to the least probable. And then in the ground truth column, I've got a zero or one, depending on whether that is a correct label or not. Does, does, is Aardvark really in this recording or not? So they're green if, if that's true. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to do is, is take a ratio of this number L and divide it by the rank. So the rank is just one through eight because we put them in sorted order. And this L, this is the number that the words in the last slide were trying to describe. So at every row here, uh, like we look at this row, every row where, where there is ground truth, you look how many uh, rows, including this one and above, how many rows include ground truth. So uh, this one, it's the row itself. This one, it's this row plus the one above. This one, uh, we got one wrong here. Uh, so we get this row plus the two that are above. So we get a score of three. All the rest don't count. Uh, and then we take the, the ratio then of this L metric by the rank, and that gives us this, and then you calculate the average of that and divide by the number of true labels that are in there. So in this case, we made a mistake, uh, but we did pretty, pretty well. Uh, we, we got three of the top four, three of the, of our top four predictions were correct. Um, and we got a 0.92. So we're pretty close to one. That's all right. Uh, one more example, if we had 
got them all right, then we would have got exactly one, just to make sure that we'd done that properly. Suppose we did the worst we could with this example, where there's only eight different uh, categories. Um, we would have got 0.28. We're penalized because um, our guesses, our predictions, were, at, were ranked low. And because we're dividing by the rank, that makes our, our number lower. But the one to me that's interesting is the first one. We really, we got one wrong, you know, and we got 0 0.92. We'll come back to that number in a minute. Any, any questions about that? We don't have to understand it in too much detail, but that it's helpful to have a sense of what these numbers, what they, what they mean. So in the context of that, let's look at the leaderboard. This is the final leaderboard after the competition closed. These are the top 10 entries. I was totally floored by these numbers. The best one is 0.98. Number 10 is still 0.95, almost 0.96. That's, that is just too good to be true. Uh, so often what happens in these Kaggle competitions is there's some kind of data leak which spoils all the results because, <clears throat> you know, some, some information. There was no data leak. There, there was a little bit of funny business going on, which I'll talk about. But this, these are the scores that people are actually able to get. Uh, I, I just can't believe the technique works that well. So either I don't understand the metric. No, our, our 0.92 where we got, I mean, to me, that's pretty darn good. We got three of the top four exactly right. We only got 0.92. Like we're not even in the running here. <laughs> so uh, you know, on average, these people are getting like 3.7 out of the top four correct or something. Anyway, so there it is. Um, leaderboard, uh, you also, not, not a lot of shakeup in leaderboard. People who are Kaggle fans will know there's often a shakeup. Uh, there's a little bit of movement between the public leaderboard and the private, but, but not a lot. A lot of people stayed where they were. There's- and Bruce? A, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. What's that uh, ranking based on? Is it just some kind of importance of what's, which species is more important or is that? No, the, yeah. uh, uh, on this leaderboard, like why is. Oh, no, no, not would, the leaderboard, um, the, uh, the ranking for calculating the LRAP, right? Yeah. So, like, how did we get this ranking of, uh, because obviously getting artwork more correct is more important than getting hair correct. All right. Is there... Well, kind of. They they didn't really weight the um, you know one one species is more important than another one, but there is this label weighted extra thing which I didn't describe, and um, they did something I and I forget exactly the purpose of it is it, it sort of give more of a, actually a balanced kind of weighting to all the different species. So they they okay. definitely were not picking the ones that they thought were the most important. So oh, is it is it weighted kind of depending on the sound that the particular animal makes? Like I no, because so, it's it's measuring the distance from the rank of what it, the true rank to what it is, right? That's that's uh, what it's. Can you just go back? To the I'm pretty sure that it would be related to the the frequency within the data set. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that. It's it's much more about the distribution of the. Uh, the, the different labels, rather yeah, because it, it was averaging the, or uh, it was taking the sum of the uh, where it where it actually it, L I J over rank mm -hmm. that that would be just finding out how f the ratio of how far away it essentially was from the 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 rank, right? Well, uh, it it is it is. But this extra, the, the extra term like label weighted is yeah. the part that is not captured by anything I've described here. So let me see if I've understood the, what your example correctly, Bruce. Like if, if Aardvark and Baboon were switched around in this um, ranking here, you'd still get yep. the same number, right? You would. That is correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. So as long as your answers are all right, it doesn't matter what order they're in. <laughs> but as soon as you have some wrong ones, then the order starts to matter because you get penalized for ones that are ranked too high. It's very hard to imagine how this algorithm would translate to using it in practice, right? Because at no point were, are we taking thresholds saying that there is this animal sound in the audio recording or there's not this animal sound in the audio recording, which you would 
have to do if you wanted to use this algorithm? Well, you could you could make the same critique about an AUC type of metric, right? Uh, the AUC metric doesn't make a choice about what threshold do you pick to make a decision. It just says, of all the choices you could make, you know, how, how are we doing? What's that curve look like? This is a little bit like that. So you're, you're right, though. At some point, you have to decide uh, whether the, the species is there or not in this recording. So you're going to have to pick a threshold and go with that or some other criterion. To, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what the consequences are if certain animal sounds are always made near each other. And so they're often, they often co-occur. And then if the algorithm just gets good at identifying one of them, then it can make a mistake between two of them. And then it would actually puts those both. I, like, I think there's, there might be some weird artifacts that come out of this that actually help increase its score just based on when the animals, I don't know. Well, that's, that's a reasonable observation. Uh, however, as when you get to see to the techniques, you'll see there is no use made of any kind of co-occurrence of species at all. It's all very independent estimates. Yeah, I, I think it's still something that might just come out of the, the way. It might just features. happen. Yeah. 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 But I can't see how it would work just right off the bat. So. Right. All right. A um, couple of there's always problems with the data. Here's some, some some challenges that makes this even harder than I would have expected. The training data is underspecified. I mentioned this before. It is only partially labeled. Uh, there are lots of totally valid, you know, examples of the one of these 24 species, and they're not labeled in the training data. This is fairly unusual for a Kaggle competition, I think. I mean, you can get noisy labels, but to have it seriously under, I'm, and I'm not sure exactly how under labeled it is. Uh, <clears throat> there would be ways to estimate that, <clears throat> excuse me, based on the thing that people did, but I didn't see anybody comment on that. It'd be interesting to know. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so, one of the things that is a consequence of this, <clears throat> is that local validation became virtually impossible. You'd like to be able to, as you're training your models, split them into two pieces. You're training on this piece, and then you're validating against this piece that you set aside. <clears throat> but you can't do that because the piece that you set aside, it's got some of the right labels. It's missing a bunch. Your, your training might be very accurate, but if it's predicting a bunch of things that aren't there, as far as the labels go, then it's going to look like you're doing that. So almost everybody just gave up trying to do local validation. I didn't hear of anybody that actually succeeded in doing that. <clears throat> so teams had different approaches for this. A uh, very common one was usually a thing you don't want to do in Kaggle, but it's to use the leaderboard for validation. So you do your best. You train on all your data. You don't do a split. Train on all your data. Submit your prediction and see what your leaderboard score is, and then use that as, as a gauge of uh, how well you, you're doing. Uh, that's risky because <clears throat> that's the public leaderboard. It's available during the competition, but the organizers hold back uh, data for the final private leaderboard, and um, that could have a different distribution. It could be different in all sorts of ways from from the public leaderboard. As it turns out in this competition, that was not an issue. That's why we didn't see a lot of shakeup at the end, even though everybody did stuff with the public leaderboard that was more than they really should have. But <clears throat> there we go. Uh, there was a lot of pseudo labeling. There was even some hand labeling going on. People trained themselves to label. One of the solutions I'm not really gonna talk about in any detail today, but this person got to the point where, <coughs> excuse me, um, they were able to label 300 uh, samples a day out of the few thousand that were given. So that's, it made a difference, but it, that's crazy. Weirdly, hand labeling was allowed, uh, at least on the training data. Um, 
there was a little bit of controversy about that uh, because you definitely don't want to hand label the test data uh, because that would definitely be cheating. But hand labeling training data, that's okay. I've seen that in other competitions as well. Some people seem to think it was kind of outrageous. I, I didn't think it was outrageous. It's just like super inefficient and you really shouldn't have to do that. But wait, there's more. The training and test, distribu dis test distributions are very different. I don't know exactly why the competition hosts set it up this way, but uh, in the training distribution, there's a reasonably uniform distribution across all the different species. In the test, though, there was like two species that really dominated uh, all the others. They're just a lot more common in the recordings. Uh, one thing I will say is that apparently, uh, well, I think the competition organizers acknowledged that there was missing labels in the training data, but in the test data, everything was labeled. Uh, they did a very thorough job on that and, you know, to the best of their abilities anyway, they, they label absolutely everything. Uh, right. So people did lots of leaderboard probing, probing, meaning that they would submit a prediction, which is basically saying everything is species one or two or three and just see what kind of a score they got from that. If you do that 24 times, then you find out what's the distribution of these different species in the test data. Um, I, I was, I didn't like that. I mean, it was in, fine. It's, it, it, it's informative to know that the dis, training test distributions are different, but people actually used that information and they adjusted some other predictions based on the distribution in the test data. That's as close as I can get to a data leak in this competition. But as we'll see, it's it's not like that bumped them up from 0.7 to 0.95 or something. It was it was a much smaller effect than that, but it did help. All right, uh, time to talk about some uh, solutions here. So uh, I, I think it was the competition host provided a baseline solution and it scored at about 0.748. The general idea here is one uh, that really kind of set the tone for many, many solutions that people did, but we'll see some significant variations as well. So you, you take your initial waveform, uh, convert it to a spectrogram. Uh, in their case, it was a MEL spectrogram. And I think that's probably one of the reasons everyone used a MEL spectrogram. Uh, we'll come back a little bit later to whether that's a good choice or not. Anyway, convert it to a spectrogram. And then you train a convolutional neural network <clears throat> on labeled subsets of the data. And then, you know, what do you do with that, right? So in the test data, you don't have any bounding boxes, of course. You've got to somehow deal with the fact that, you, that you've just got this one minute long audio recording. So they would typically take five second clips. Well, first of all, uh, when they're training, they would, they would take five second uh, clips near where the data was labeled. Uh, so um, even if the, the bounding box was like two seconds long, they'd, they'd look at the five second area around it, train it on that so that they could sort of recognize things within a five second window. Then at inference, when they had to make the predictions, they would do that on rolling five second windows, rolling and overlapping five second windows. <clears throat> So is that moderately clear, the, the general approach there? Uh, nobody's asking anything, so I assume that nobody has any clue what I just said, but we'll, we'll just keep pushing on. Okay, uh, so I've got several slides in the first place solution because it lets us sort of dive a little bit deeper into some of these ideas. <clears throat> it also gives you a sense of, <coughs> excuse me, tickle on the throat. It gives you a sense of the things, the crazy things you have to do to get first place versus not first place. So this is an ensemble of several uh, convolutional networks. And that's not a surprise at all in a Kaggle competition. You often train more than one network and then take some sort of um, blending of the results of all those to get a, a better blended result. They did use MEL spectrograms. And they found a way to use both hard and weak labels. So the hard labels, uh, we were calling them strong labels before, uh, were the ones that were given to us in, the, in those CSV files. 
The weak labels are ones they created themselves. So uh, pseudo labels and hand labeling. Pseudo labels means that you you train a model to make predictions. <clears throat> then you go back and predict on your training data. And if it predicts that, uh, you know, in these time and place that you're going to get uh, a certain species, but it wasn't labeled, you weren't given that label, but you, you say you're going to use that label anyway. So it, it's called pseudo labeling. Pretty, pretty handy technique in lots of contexts. And it really makes sense here, given that there's so many missing labels. So these pseudo labels are probably fairly, um, I mean, it's kind of reasonable when you know that there's actually labels that would be valid, but they're missing. Then I've there's this post-pro... Yeah. Sorry, Bruce. I've also heard of yeah. pseudo labels being used to label test data. But in this case, yeah. you said training data specifically. They are not pseudo labeling the test data. It's all about the training data. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the final thing is they <clears throat> did this post-processing step where they scaled the model predictions based on what they had learned from probing the leaderboard, the technique I said I didn't like. <clears throat> uh, they used the public leaderboard for validation. And uh, as we talked about, the augmentation was kind of interesting. Um, they used this uh, mix-up technique where you, you sort of blend two samples together and you blend their labels together and then it's, it's a kind of augmentation. <clears throat> I've always thought that was a little weird. However, in the case of audio data, at least it makes some sense because if you, if you add two audio things together, you get, you know, a different audio thing. It's when you, it's when you're blending a cat image and a dog image that I've never, I just couldn't buy into that. Anyway, so they use mix up Gaussian noise. Sure. Why not? Uh, just to model in a crude way interfering sounds. Uh, you want to be robust in the space of that. And then they used uh, spec augment, which is a collection of techniques that were published uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it involves uh, time warping and frequency masks and time masks. Uh, I think I say a little bit more about this on the next slide. I'll, I'll talk about it now. So time warping just means that you sort of you keep the um, in a certain region that you're that you're interested in. You maybe keep the first and and last uh, samples the same, but in between you kind of mush things around by by moving the samples back and forth in in some fashion. Uh, frequency masks means you just like blot out uh, frequencies. You just pretend they're all zero in a certain range. So ditto with time. You, you take some seg segment of time in the region of interest and just mask it out. Said it's set all the values to zero there. Uh, th this is, I don't know if it's, I guess it's an augmentation. What you want to do with any of these augmentation techniques is make changes that should leave, this is a classification problem. So you want to leave the class the same, even if these uh, things are applied. Uh, spec augment was really designed for speech uh, recognition to enhance the data that you get for speech recognition. Something like time warping makes a lot of sense there because <clears throat> people, when they're talking, they have a different cadence in their speech and they'll speak more slowly, more quickly, all those sorts of things. So that makes sense. You want to be robust. And for a particular word, for example, it can be said in a lot of different ways and you want to be able to uh, recognize them all. So it makes sense to time warp your data. That's good. The frequency mass, time mass is more, I guess, just kind of a regularization that Makes, makes, uh, makes us you don't overfit too much on the data. The time warping here for animal calls, though, seems a little less justified to me. I think there's, I may be wrong, but I think there's more consistency uh, between even different individual representatives of a particular class of uh, birds, for example. Uh, so the time warping may just make it look like something that's not, would never be like a bird call of that, of that type. However, I'm not going to argue with success, 0.985 or whatever it was. What do I know? Uh, so as I mentioned before, they did hard label models and they did weak label models. So let's talk about the hard label models first. Uh, so they go to this metal spectrogram and they uh, 
they run the Bell spectrogram, sorry, they run uh, efficient net, which is a standard image classifier of the uh, image net type uh, as their as their backbone. They ran it over this and then they do a, a mean pool over the, in the frequency dimension, which is um, interesting to me that to me that loses some in, in information about the frequency that, that could be interesting and, and some of the other techniques did something a little more sophisticated with frequencies, but anyway, it worked well for these folks. Then run it through the linear layer to make a prediction, but <clears throat> to calculate the loss on that prediction, they basically mask out uh, everything that isn't, now keep in mind, this is the training data, so we have these bounding boxes, so they would just mask out everything that isn't inside one of the bounding boxes. And I think, I'm not sure if they're colors, I'm guessing these three green ones are true positives and the yellow ones are uh, false positive. So they would apply that to their prediction and then calculate the loss on that. So a masked loss. They thought that was a very important technique. It probably was. <clears throat> in other weak label models, uh, in this case, they didn't use the false positives. Uh, they couldn't figure out how that could help in this case. They just used the true positives. They took the hard label models, the ones we just talked about, Use those to predict labels, and those became pseudo labels in the training data, and then they trained on on those. They did some hand labeling. This group what didn't go too crazy with that, and I don't think they got a whole lot out of uh, doing that. They used several different backbones. I mentioned efficient net for the hard labels. They used just a whole bunch of them for the weak labels, and and with 120 different models. Great. So uh, how do you combine 120 weak label models? And I, I'm not sure how many hard label models they did. I'm sure several. So the final, almost final step is to then uh, blend these all together. So what they would do is you've got these different categories of uh, models. So you've got hard labels at the top, and weak at the bottom. In between, there's some sort of mixture. Let's see, different backbones trained on weak labels. Models train additional labels, replace species, uh, 12 and 18, especially, you know, different ways of getting these models. Then they bag them, meaning they, they would pick a subset of these, a random subset in each category. And then they'd you know, look at the predictions that each of them made. They'd look at the maximum, or they maybe they'd look at the mean, or the maximum here, the mean. Apply a power scale or a linear scale of some kind blend the whole thing together with an averaging technique, and then that became their final submission. Um, so I went over that kind of quickly, but I'm not sure I understand it much more than what I just said, but, you know, there's ways to, to put together predictions from multiple models. And uh, they seem to get some good results from that. <coughs> you don't know with many of these, uh, very few cases, do they actually do any kind of ablation study? So, you know, how how helpful was this uh, to them? I'll, I'll have a little bit to say about some of the techniques and later on, but mostly you don't know. Everyone's in a big hurry to just get through the competition and do as well as they can. If it works, it works. And they don't necessarily uh, ask how, how much it worked. Do you know where that team was from? Like, this is a ton of modeling and messing things together. What, how did they get all this power? Uh, three, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not exactly sure where you know, who they work for or anything, but there's three of them. They're all Kaggle grandmasters and they had at least one of them had entered the, the bird call competition and got first place there. So they're very experienced with this sort of stuff. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of stuff going on here that if this is your first competition, you wouldn't think of all this stuff uh, for sure. But now you've got this example to work from. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to jump to the sixth place solution, you know, two, three, four, and five, uh, those were good solutions too, but there's a lot of similarity to what we just talked about. I wanted to jump to something just a little bit different. So what was interesting to me was it got a, quite a good result from using just a single model, not blending a hundred and some models, but just a single model. Uh, and they called it a five fold model. Uh, they didn't so they broke it into folds, they, they split up the data, but they didn't really use the other one as, as a, uh, uh, so much as a uh, validation set, but just to have different subsets of, of, of the data. But anyway, they had a single model um, and 
they got 0.961 out of that. They they did some other stuff to try to make it better and they end up with 0.968, so they improved it a bit, but really they did. So that's interesting to me. Most other groups had multiple models. These folks had one. Uh, so these folks, back to the question of ordinary versus MEL spectrogram, they said, huh, why is everybody using a MEL spectrogram? MEL spectrogram was designed to uh, somehow model the characteristics of the human hearing system and human, well, more the human, hear, human hearing system. These aren't humans. They're birds and frogs and things that have evolved to, you know, hear each other. And uh, and that was my first thought as well. Why is everybody using a male spectrum? I sort of decided, well, yeah, but they are biological hearing systems and wouldn't surprise me that much. Maybe our animal physiologists on the call could tell me that maybe their hearing system is not so different from ours. Uh, and uh, the assumptions that go into a male spectrogram might be just as valid here as anywhere else. I wouldn't uh, think it'd be that different. I would, I would yeah. approximate a bird as a human, sure. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah. Yeah, there's actually nothing particularly physically natural about a linear spectrogram. Uh, a linear scale spectrogram, that's just mathematically convenient. But I think most perceptual things for biological things are uh, often on a logarithmic scale. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure you'd expect birds and frogs to be that different from people. It, it People are a pretty good prior for birds, I would say. Uh, okay, so um, let's see if I can recall how this all worked. Um, so they talk about a per class time frequency cropping. So they, you know, they, um, they chopped up the, the time and frequencies in a way that, uh, matched the statistics of these bounding boxes. And we, we looked a little bit of, of what the distribution of those bounding boxes looked like before. So they actually calculated all that. I was surprised more people didn't do this. This makes sense to me. You know, you want to know for, the species, here's a typical length, uh, and so on. Uh, we'll come back to exactly what they did with that. But uh, typically, like everybody else, they expanded 24 to 26. Nothing too special there. What was a little bit weird to me was they trained on the labeled bounding boxes, but they made them all the same size by stretching them. And... That was, I guess, so they could fit them all into the same convolutional network and not have to worry about any size uh, mismatches. I don't know how necessary that was. And it's a little unclear to me what you would do at inference time. Um, it's, and they never really described that. Maybe it was obvious to them. Uh, in any case, you know, they, they took these different size boxes, stretched them out, and then trained their model on, on that. It was a simple image classifier. It just they they, they wrote the code in their in their write up. They said here's the like the six lines it took to actually do the classification. In that case, it, it outputs twenty six logits, and they put that into a um, a cross entropy thing. They did something interesting here, which is I, I commented on the first place solution that it wasn't clear to me that they were preserving the the location of the frequencies uh, well enough with their technique. Even though they won, still like all these all these things work better in practice than in theory. But the the position of the frequency, like how high or low it is, is kind of important because it's a very characteristic of the species uh, where the the frequency is. And uh, so there's an interesting technique from a paper that I haven't really read yet, but it's on my reading list now called Co Chord Conv, where they've noticed that in some applications of uh, spectrogram analysis, uh, you really want to know not just characteristics of the frequency because it's not um well you want to know where it is if you if you go back to image classification if you've got a dog in your image you want to classify it as dog or cat <clears throat> you don't care where the dog is in the image it could be anywhere shifted around in the x direction or the y direction it's sort of translation invariant where the dog is if you're trying to classify a bird call it does matter you, you can shift it in time that's fine it'll be the same bird if you shift it in frequency it starts looking like a different bird so you don't want that. You want to keep track of that. So basically what they do is they come up with some encoding of position and feed that in as an extra channel into the networks that they're training. Uh, the cord con, um, 
the technique there, I think uh, it's not like a Fourier-based thing with sines and cosines, which you see in transformer models and so, and so on, but it's some, some way of encoding the position. Uh, so I thought that was a, that was a good idea. Uh, mix over, um, it's a variant of mix up, but it allowed them to include the false positives in that augmentation technique and allowed them to create a balanced distribution for supervised training, all good. Augmentations, time jitter, white noise, those are both things that make sense to me. Uh, jitter here just means uh, within the bounding box, just shift it back and forth a little bit, but not stretching and warping it so much. They did look at external data, uh, mostly to add diversity to their trainings that they wanted uh, more negative examples of species that weren't in uh, the, the set, even though they had lots. And that added about 0.03 to their score, so that was okay. No hand labeling. They did use pseudo-labeling. And uh, the person said, who wrote it up, it was a three-person team, the person who wrote it up said, all the ideas were done and implemented in about seven days. Uh, that was a little puzzling because they did have 234 submissions and you're only allowed to have five submissions per day. So I couldn't quite connect the dots on that. But, and that may have been his uh, particular contribution, I'm not sure, and it kind of won the day. He joined the team fairly late. Still, it, this was one of the simpler solutions. It was kind of nice to see something that was not crazy complicated. It, it may have sounded complicated in my rushed explanation, but it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Uh, they, they did really well. Uh, sixth is fine. Absolutely fine in a team of 1,000. That's all right. Uh, 11 place solution, and we're getting near the end here. Uh, just a couple more slides. So uh, they did time frequency crops. Uh, in their case, they uh, wanted to uniform, uh, uniformize, standardize on a four second uh, scale in the, in the x axis. So they would, they would pad. A lot of them were less than four seconds, so they pad them. If there was big in the four seconds, they, they said they resized, which I took to mean they squished it rather than cropped, but they didn't specify that. They also put a positional encoding on the frequency axis. This axis, that, that makes good sense to me. And then at inference time, uh, they did these sliding uh, time crops, and they, they would take the maximum prediction over all those uh, time positions. So they trained one model, but then at inference time, they would run it separately on 26 classes. They ran it as if it were a, um, you know, a binary classifier, 26 different times. And they didn't say this exactly, but I'm guessing that, hmm, I, I'm guessing that they masked the frequencies to, for the class. They knew what the, the range of frequencies they were expecting for that class. So they would mask that and then run the inference on that. Again, not a lot of details on that. They tried some other things. Semi-supervised learning didn't, didn't really help very much. Um, no external data. They tried it, ran out of time. Uh, they, they came back to it afterwards and said it would have helped a little bit, but not a huge amount. They didn't know about this distribution tweaking post-processing step. Uh, even without that, their leaderboard uh, went up by 0.02 between public and private. And... Uh, they they jumped several positions actually. So you know they did okay, with, even though they didn't probe the leaderboard. They calculated it later when they realized that people were going to process it. They could have got another 0.02 on that, and that would have jumped them up from the 11th place slot to I think number four. So it would have been a significant addition. So there's a little bit of an indication of how much that little tweak uh, would help. Uh, so these slides are available and there's, there's links to a bunch of things. Uh, it was kind of interesting. There's a San Diego machine learning meetup group that talked about the same competition. I didn't know that when I volunteered to do this one, but that was interesting. They had some good discussion there. Uh, and that's it. Any more questions? Would you be able to go back to the, the slides um, from the, the organizer's paper where they had the um, like the bounding, like an idealized bounding box um, for a bunch of the different species? So I've been trying to, to figure out exactly why it might be that um, that using like a, a normal spectrograph might work better than using a, a Mel mm. spectrograph. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only thing that I could think of is that, like, in a, a MEL spectrograph, the um, the higher frequencies would appear more compressed, whereas the lower ones would be, be more expanded. So you might get a better resolution of the, the higher frequencies. 
Right. Um, Sorry, more resolution at the lower frequencies. No, the the higher ones, right? Because like the, the in a in a male spectrograph, you get a higher resolution at the, the lower frequencies because they um. Mm-hmm. Uh, a small oh, I, I'm sorry. I yeah, you're arguing for a linear spectrogram. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Fine. Fine. Well, okay. I'll counter that argument by saying the most important information is probably in the lower end of the the frequencies. There's a lot less energy as you go higher up, typically. <clears throat> but if but, there's more species with a high frequency, like a lot of bird calls are mm-hmm. very high pitched. True. Thank you. They give you the range of the frequency of each um, species, right? So it would be curious if the ranges are smaller at lower frequencies and larger at larger frequencies. That might be a good argument for... I would expect that that would be true. Um, Mm -hmm. Yep, that would be a very interesting calculation to do. And that would would give you a a clue as to which type of spectrogram might be the one to use. Hmm. I have a question regarding uh, pseudo labeling. So uh, I've seen this technique being used across many Kago competitions. So how does the accuracy of the pseudo labeling play into the final accuracy of the competition? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I, I didn't bring any numbers about how much it improved, but I think th- some people did report on that. Uh, they they did get a significant bump by using these pseudo labels, but they also use them judiciously. Uh, if they generated a hundred pseudo labels, they might only use ten of them in a in any particular uh, training batch. Um, so they didn't ascribe too much weight to them, but even using that <clears throat> small subset, they found that helpful. Okay, and and so how do they validate that it's correct? Do they is this where um, the uh, public leaderboard probing helps? Only in a very <clears throat> only indirect way. I mean, just the fact that using those pseudo labels got get them a better answer is some evidence that there's some correctness to them. I guess if you really wanted to, um, if you really wanted to explore that, you could hold back some of the true labels, train without those, and then try to predict those true labels as pseudo labels and see how you're doing. But mostly, mostly you don't know. You just hope that your, your model is, is doing okay and that you can squeeze a little bit more out of it by using its predictions okay in, okay holding back um holding back true labels and um and predicting them using the, the classifier is pretty much exactly cross-validation though uh yep that's true yeah fair enough yeah so if your cross-validation is doing okay in, in a case where you're allowed to or you know you can do that that's a, that's an indication that your pseudo labels are not going to be terrible yeah okay but, but are, are you trying to aim for a very high accuracy for the pseudo labeling or well the higher the better of course uh if if they're just complete garbage that's not going to help you at all uh but i think it's a reasonable assumption to say if you've you know you've trained on some good data and your model's decent that those pseudo labels are going to be reasonably accurate in many cases um and again, uh, we, you hear a lot about pseudo labeling in competitions. Usually, they're pseudo labeling the the test data, not the training data. Uh, so here, this kind of unusual situation uh, caused them to to label the uh, the pseudo label the training data. And I think it's reasonable to think that that that, that would help. I, I'm not surprised that people got a got a benefit from that. There are also instances that I've heard of in competitions where people have, um, where the labels, labels have been particularly noisy. So they've replaced the, mm-hmm. um, the, the um, training labels with pseudo labels that they consider more accurate. And that helps right. the model right. generalize a bit better. 
Yeah, your model predictions uh, have the effect of kind of smoothing out noisiness in the labels it learned from, uh, if you've got enough training data. So you could hope that their predictions are actually better than some of the original labeling, which can have lots of errors and other kinds of noise in them. And when it comes to classification, if it's a single class classification and you actually train on the labels that are incorrect, that has a really detrimental impact on what your model is learning or what your mm -hmm. model is able to learn. So mm -hmm. even getting rid of, of a few of those is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can I ask a question? Okay. Yes, please do. Um, the sixth place solution used core convolution, if I'm right, and the eleventh position, eleventh uh, um, place solution used positional encoding, right? Uh, yes. So yeah, um, core uh, con, I, I, correct? Yeah. So, so I suppose that. These two techniques are basically same for this challenge. Am I right? Can, can you please compare? Yeah, they're they're pretty similar. I think I I don't know a lot of details about uh, how they work and how they're different, but uh, and I would I would guess that it's not extremely important exactly how you inject position information into the problem or into the the data, as long as you do it in some way that's you know on a, one position is. Uh, unambiguously specifying the the position, <clears throat> um, and you don't modify that position information. It's, it's something you know uh, a priori, and uh, so you keep it constant through the training process. But I think, yeah, whether you do it as sort of this linear gradient or cosines and cosines, as long as the model can get some unambiguous information about position, it can probably figure out what to do with it. All right, that brings us to eight o'clock. Bruce, another amazing presentation. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, yeah, let's hold off on the applause, please. Let me uh, <laughs> got, sorry, got this down. All right, so let's give Bruce a big round of applause all together. Let's all unmute ourselves. <laughs> let's give him a big round of applause in four seconds. Three. Four, three, two, one. All they right. can't wait. They can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> uh, thanks, all. It was, it was a lot of fun.